Welcome to New York City and Mission City Church. We're here to connect people with God and with each other. We hope you're encouraged by this week's message. Ephesians 5, 22 to 33. And it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything as such, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, Husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Uh, we have been in a, uh, in a study for the last several weeks of the New Testament letter, usually called a book, New Testament book of Ephesians. And Ephesians is one of the earliest examples of Christian literature. It's the inspired word of God. And uh, it, it works in the order of God giving us identity, forgiveness, and grace through Jesus and, and security of a relationship with Jesus through faith alone, not by our religious cleanup or any of that nature, of any of that kind of thing, uh, but rather just simply to trust him. And then from there in Ephesians, he begins to explain, the, the author is Paul, the early Christian inspired apostle Paul, starts to explain how to live in various areas of Christian life. And so we are now to a section of various areas of Christian life that affects some, but not all of us, which is the area of marriage. And this is a passage that uh, says, uh, it gives instructions to wives and it gives instructions to husbands. Because of that, it is often read at Christian weddings. And it often gets a very particular reaction. So I'm excited to share this with you. I once read this at a wedding. I read it several times at a wedding. But at this one particular wedding, I'm reading this and it took a few extra minutes to explain it, you know. But it's a wedding ceremony. We don't have 40 minutes like we got today. Um, so I got to be kind of brief, you know. But just for five minutes or so, I'm like talking about this text and what it means and what it doesn't mean. And there is a woman in about the fourth row she looked to be about 40 or 50 years old, and she was looking back at me, and all I can tell you is she was not feeling it. It was like, she was like shifting in her seat back and forth. There was like a couple of like audible like huffs and puffs, you know, sighs, really frustrated. Um, and she, you know, kind of look around, a couple eye rolls, throw her head. It, she wasn't, uh, I don't think she was a threat to like interrupt the wedding ceremony, but I would put it this way. Whoever was like one or two rows behind her, it was really clear that she was not feeling it. And I thought she might come up to me after the ceremony. It's been done. So, um, but instead, another woman came up to me, a different woman of about the same age. And she said, Pastor, I just want to thank you. That was so disarming and reasonable and biblical and clear. I just don't see how anybody could have found a way to disagree with what you said. And I thought, I should have introduced you to the person in the fourth row <laughs> because she found a way, you know? Um, and every single time, I, I want to share this as a jumping off point for this text because every single time I have ever done a sermon, written a blog, an article, or sat with a, uh, uh, an engaged couple or dating couple and talked through this subject every single time, no matter how I say it, and I hope I get a little better at saying it every time, but no matter how I say it, I always get both reactions every time. There is like, there's the head that shakes and it's just like, no. And then there's the head that nods that is like, this is so clarifying and helpful. So I know exactly what it is at the end of this sermon. I know whether it's presently in this room or future podcast listeners who go back to the you know, dusty archives or whatever, I know there are going to be some people who get to the end of this message and they think, now that was a clarifying force for good, you know? And then there are going to be others who finish the same podcast, the same sermon, and get to the end of this same message, and they're going to think, now that 
was upholding the patriarchy and extremely harmful, all right? So I know that both of those reactions come. And I just want to tell you today, I'm not trying to control your reaction because I already know I can't. Um, it doesn't do any good. I'm not trying to be anybody's villain, and I'm not trying to be anybody's hero. I just want you to see what the biblical text says, and then you make the call as to whether this is something that you could implement if you're married. And uh, if you're a Christian, I would encourage you to listen and just see what the text says, and we often have to separate this from what it doesn't say. Um, so this subject, marriage roles, it does this every time. Um, a couple of quick things to note. Um, the topic is unavoidable. I'm sure someone's thinking, can we just avoid this? Okay, well, not if we have any integrity. Remember, we've been studying line by line the whole book of Ephesians. We're just going to skip this one. If we skip scriptures we're uncomfortable with, you should go to another church because that's not good, right? So if we just skip scriptures we're uncomfortable with, no good. So we've come to this as a part of our systematic study, so it's staring us right in the face. But it's also in other parts of the scripture. So this is not an avoidable topic. This is also um, not something that was just invented. You know, I, there, there's a lot of popular literature going around now that the idea is that, well, the marriage role, biblical marriage roles, like, don't even exist. Like, it's a figment of some 1940s, you know, in, in imagination, you know, and it was just made up during Victorian England. I've heard it all. All right? And so, but the, here's the thing. There are certain patches of, pa passages of Scripture that say husbands do X and wives do Y, and X and Y aren't the same. So there's no way to avoid the idea that there is some amount of role differentiation, right? This is not an invented thing, and it's not an avoidable thing, all right? So can't get out of it that way. Um, I'd love to also clarify here as part of this preamble um, that this topic is marriage roles, not gender roles. There's a difference, okay? So Paul, when he writes wives, he's talking about a behavior that's given to one man, and when he writes to husbands and tells them how to treat their wives, he's telling them how to treat one woman. So this is not a script for, the, uh, for how men and women interact. There's some overlap with that, obviously. But the main, main point of what's being said here is about marriage roles, how a husband and wife treat each other, not how men and women, per se, in the public sphere treat each other according to their varied relationships. Another bit of preamble you'd want to know. Every spouse fails these ideals. Every spouse fails these ideals. If you've been married longer than five minutes, you have failed these ideals. Um, you've, uh, marriage is about apologizing. It's about trying to get back on track. It's about the pendulum swinging in every wrong direction. And sometimes you get it right and sometimes you don't. So every spouse fails this. So if you're thinking, I don't know a woman who would ever be able to do that all the time, you're right. And if you're thinking, I don't know a man who would be able to do that all the time, you're already right. Everybody fails these ideals. I fail these ideals. If we just want to pass the mic to my wife, Gabby, she could expound on the ways that I fail these ideals. Um, but then we would just lose all moral authority and you would be discouraged. All right. So we're going we're gonna to move forward here. But everybody fails these ideals. And if you're single and you're like, but I, when I get there, if God allows, I will not fail these ideals. Yes, you will. You absolutely will. Because that's what it is to be a fallen human being. All right. So everybody fails these ideals. Also, we tend to like or dislike these words of the scripture based on our experiences. Now, I'm not talking no, so much about accept or reject. Sometimes you accept something, but you don't feel good about it. I'm talking about like and dislike. We usually like or dislike something based on our experiences because we may be looking at something, like a biblical text, but we're usually looking through our experiences. For example, I am looking at this pillar, but I'm looking through my contact lenses, you see? So something's affecting me at a very close range. So even though I'm looking at something that's in the distance, something's affecting me from the very close range. For instance, um, when I was 14, my mother was in an abusive marriage that lasted about five or six months, and it was a very traumatic time. Uh, I think the word trauma can be overused. I'm not overusing it here. It was an extremely traumatic time for our family. And um, she got put in the hospital a couple times. Um, I was 14 years old, if I didn't say that. My little sister was about nine. And it was hard. I will never, just because of that one experience, we had police over the house, we, the whole deal. So I will never, I had a good childhood too. There were great moments. There were great moments. I just want to defend my parents and let you know there were great moments. But there were hard moments. And so we've done that. And because of that, I will never, 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 never be able to read Scripture, these words of Scripture, without thinking, how would that work for my mom? You know, like in, in, the, in her darkest hour, you know, so we all, and I don't know what your experiences are. I look around this room and I have no idea what your experiences are, but I think we could probably agree. The feeling we have in our gut 
about this already is probably, probably has a lot to do, whether it's positive or negative, has a lot to do with whether you've seen it done well or seen it done poorly. If you are coming from a background where marriage just didn't go this way and it's more about self-protection, physically, emotionally, spiritually, sexually, and even financially, you know, separate everything and just kind of protect yourself from your spouse, this sounds like crazy. But if you're coming from an environment where you're like, I saw mom and dad live in a Christian marriage and it was a thing of beauty. I've seen this work for good. You're probably feeling nothing but positive right now. But let's just draw to the surface that we probably like or dislike this. At the start, we all have some, some reaction, very few neutral people. Uh, and we usually like or dislike this based on our experiences. Just good for you to know. Doesn't change what the text says. Just good for you to know. That's how we interact with it. Next, historical timing is irrelevant. This is a huge issue. Um, historical timing, like where we're at in history, is irrelevant. And the reason for that is the Bible doesn't come with an expiration date in any of its parts. So it's, I'm aware that this text was written in about A.D. 62. It's 2022. A few things have happened. I know that. However, there is no part of, uh, of the Scripture that comes, there's no part, particularly the New Testament literature, that comes with like a, an obvious footnote in the side that says, you know, best used before such and such a date. You know how an exp- expiration date works, right? The way an expiration date works is if you consume it before the expiration date, we're good. If you consume it after the expiration date, something bad is going to happen, all right? And sometimes this is exactly how people feel about this text, is they think, ooh, okay, that says what it says in Ephesians 5. Maybe before, like, say, 1963, like, that's okay to consume. But after that, it's probably bad to consume. But the scripture just doesn't come with an expiration date that we can throw out because it tastes funny to us at this point. So historical timing is irrelevant. Um, Next, this is all just preamble. I promise we're going somewhere. Um, Next, talking about marriage today means we've come to a place where we're going to talk about marriage. It doesn't mean marriage is assumed. It doesn't mean marriage is default. Um, By 1 Corinthians 7 standards, half the church should be single. And I know numerically we don't have to aim for that. However, Singleness is a prized vocation. It's a prized life stage by Scripture, all right? And it speaks to our, uh, our idolatry of family that instead of receiving it as a blessing and a potential gift that God would give us in order to make disciples through that arena and reflect him to the world, instead of accepting it as one possible outcome, it shows our idolatry that we assume it's the default, as if singleness is some waiting game for the next life stage. That's not what biblical singleness is. It's an opportunity to serve God and deploy yourself to him, just as marriage is. If you center marriage in your heart, whether you're single or married, that's going to lead to a problem because God is supposed to be central in the heart, all right? So um, talking about marriage today doesn't mean I'm assuming that all people are married or ever will be, okay? It's a whole different conversation. We've just come to married people today, hence the focus. And then finally, before we just open the text together and go in, know this. Marriage roles are a dance, a dance, meant to display God. That's why. That's the big why. They're a dance. Doesn't mean you could, it doesn't mean you couldn't do it some other way, but it means some other way wouldn't reveal God. Do you see? This is a dance designed to display God. And the reason that's important is we don't read this like we're reading choreography, like this is a dance that would reveal God to the world. Because think about our narrative. The gospel is that God sacrificed himself in love in order to inspire human trust. And that's how we are saved, right? So marriage is meant to be a parable of that, a reflection of that, right? And we'll see that more in the text as we go. So this is a dance we do to display God. doesn't mean it's the only way it can work. It means it's the only way to display God in the marital relationship. And we don't read it like, this is choreography. This is a dance to display God. We read it more like the fine print of a contract, like who's, who's trying to get me? You know what I'm saying? Like, who, I need to protect myself, I need to examine back and forth. And all of a sudden, we're reading it much more like constriction and opportunity, and we're thinking in, that it's a referendum on ability or something like that, instead of seeing that this is about a dance that displays God and how God relates to humanity. All right, so this is a dance that we're talking about doing here, not a court ruling, okay? And it's not about, this is not about rights and abilities and talents. This is about a dance to display God, all right? And that's really, really important. Now, um, I'm going to make five moves today, just five. Um, And uh, I hope, I'll give them to you again at the end and as we go, so you don't have to catch these right now. Um, I made them as brief as I could with my wife's help. I asked my wife before I did this message. I was was like, this is what I'm thinking about saying. And she was like, I want you to cut two thirds of that out and just summarize. I'm like, okay, I'll do that. So uh, thanks to her, we got five short ideas now. First, um, in some ways, 
Husbands and wives, I heard that. Um, in, in, in some ways, husbands and wives are the same. In some ways, husbands and wives are different. We're going to get to that in a moment. Hang tight. Number three, spouse sameness includes equal dignity, value, importance, sexual willingness, and an obedience to Scripture. Any Scripture not limited to the other spouse or specified to the other spouse. Number four, spouse difference includes what you heard in Ephesians, the submission of a wife and the love of a husband. More definition on that later. And then number five, my conclusion that I can't force on you, but I certainly offer to you, is that the Bible is uniquely balanced and leads to uniquely healthy marriages. All right, we'll retrace those steps. You weren't supposed to catch all that, but let's start with number one. In some ways, husbands and wives are the same. There's a beautiful sameness um, to husbands and wives, and I would love for you to see this. All right, so this is Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. We're going way back to the very beginning before sin created any sort of distrust or brokenness or death to our relationships and the dance that a husband and wife are doing together. This is the first marriage. This is Adam and Eve. And you're going to see some sameness here. Keep an eye out for that part, the symmetry, okay? Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them, and man here means humankind. And let them, humankind, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man, that means humankind, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. And then just for extra clarity, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply the earth, fill the earth, or sorry, be, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now in the next chapter, Genesis 2, we get a zoomed in retelling of the same event. Keep an eye out here for the sameness of, of, of husband and wife, the symmetry, okay, the ways they're the same. Then the Lord God said, it's not good that the man should be alone. The man was created first. I will make a helper fit for him, fit for him, same as him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. There was no one like him. So the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon the man, and when he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, fashioned, and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, the narrator jumps in here, inspired by God. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Their bodies are compatible, is what that means. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now, that's a flyby of man and woman in Genesis, in the very beginning, before anything ever went wrong with the world and before anything ever went wrong between men and women. I don't know what you heard in terms of sameness there, but let me tell you what I heard. I heard they have equal value. So the man is not more valuable than the woman, and the woman is not more valuable than the man. They are the same in terms of worth. I heard that they're equal image bearers of God. So man, male, does not represent God better than woman or female, and female does not represent God better than male. So in their ability to be an agent and a representative of God, they are entirely equal. They're equal in purposefulness. I'm not sure if you caught that, but it said both of you, okay, both of you subdue the earth. You both have a job to do. So they're both equal in purposefulness. Um, this purpose wasn't especially giving to, given to man or to woman. It was given to both. They are equal in human identity, okay? Whenever Adam first saw Eve, he said, finally, one like me. He didn't say almost, you know, like she's something else. He said, finally, this one is like me. He remember even hanging out with the animals, naming the animals, okay? That's a long time. You're a man alone, and you're like, they're walking by, and you're like, hippopotamus, next aardvark next okay like this is where we're at all right and then finally he sees a woman and he doesn't say he's not emphasizing their difference he's emphasizing their sameness this one is like me that's good news all right so there's an equality in that way in human identity they're equal in dignity it says they were both both that's an important word they were both naked and unashamed so they were right in their own eyes in every way and right in the other person's eyes in every way. It was the way it was supposed to be. So they were equal in being uh, free of self-consciousness in every way. And they're also equal in prioritizing a new marriage. Uh, it says that, you know, that they leave, the man shall leave his, 
his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, which of course presumes that she leaves her family too. So they both equally have that opportunity in front of them to leave their existing families. That is a lot of sameness, all right? And that's what I mean when I say in many ways, husbands and wives are the same. And they're really, really important that you know that because if you don't know that in some really, really important ways, husbands and wives are the same, what's gonna happen is, is we're, gonna, we're gonna build these barriers that we think human communication can't cross and we're gonna lose all common ground and lose touch with each other and the world's just gonna continue its power struggle and its lack of ability to understand one another. So you've gotta start on some amount of common ground here and realize that God has made us equal in so many beautiful ways, the same in so many beautiful ways, all right? Now, there is some amount of, of interchangeability, all right? Some amount of interchangeability. But there's also some amount of non-interchangeability. To use like a painfully obvious example, men do not have babies. Men do not give birth. And I know in our fit of creativity, we've now created an emoji of a pregnant man. And I want to tell you, I'm not Mr. Controversial Pastor. I'm not trying to start a fight with anybody. But that's dumb, all right? There's no such thing as a pregnant male, all right, with a belly that's showing, all right? Sin makes us silly, okay? Like, this just makes no sense, all right? So there is some amount of non-interchangeability that should be obvious that we're currently as a culture trying to tinker with, but there is just some amount of non-interchangeability that's there. The question is, from a Christian perspective, what? Like, what is it, you know, in the text? What does the Bible say where we're the same and where we're non-interchangeable, okay? So number two, in some ways, husbands and wives are different, in some ways, we've got to be different, right? Not just physically, not just biologically, but some ways behaviorally, we're different. Now, here's what I heard. I won't reread that whole text. But if that was fresh on your mind now, um, let's go back through it in your mind. And what differences did you hear in Genesis 1 and 2? I'll tell you what I heard. Now, I want to say on the basis of these differences, I'm not building behavioral habits. I'm not saying because of the differences I see in Genesis 1 and 2, therefore behaviors change in X, Y, Z ways. So I'm not really using this to create roles. I'm going to let Ephesians do that in just a moment, okay? But I'm just going to observe what's different. Like what is asymmetrical in Genesis 1 and 2 between these two, just at, just at a glance? Here's what I heard. They're different in origin, so the woman was taken out of the man. The man was not taken out of the woman. They're different, therefore, in origin order. She was not made first. They were not made at the same time. He was made first, and the woman was made directly after that. They're different in name. So in Hebrew, you even see it phonetically. There's a relationship, but it's not the same. The Hebrew word is ish for man and isha for woman. So there's clearly some overlap. There's clearly a relationship, but it's not the same. So there's some amount of difference. This is not an ish. It's not another ish, this is an isha. This is a different kind of being. Um, they're different in sexual anatomy. I'm not gonna belabor the point and talk down to anybody. We, they're different in sexual anatomy. And then they're different in role responsibility. It says, this is the closest thing we get to any sort of a hint at behavior. I don't think it's super clear. I think the rest of the text, the rest of the Bible helps us interpret these words. But it says clearly that she is a helper for him. It doesn't say he's a helper for her, that they're helpers for each other. It says that she is a helper for him. So that's what it says. Now, what that means exactly is not what we think when we hear the word help. When we hear the word help, we hear something demeaning and belittling, like, oh, I need to go hire some help, you know, somebody to take care of the junk drawer, somebody to do something belittling or small. That is not what the word help means. That's us reading our version of help back onto the text. God himself is called the helper of Israel. So this is a demeaning term. It's hard to say God is a helper if, if helper is a bad thing. It says that God is a helper of Israel. Jesus himself called the Holy Spirit a, a helper, right? And so you can't call the Holy Spirit something belittling, especially if you're the son. Jesus the son calls the Holy Spirit the helper. So if you hear the word helper and you're like, oh, no way. Wife is helper? I don't think so. Help is something belittling. I want to tell you it's not the help you're thinking of, all right? It's a, it, is, it is something critical and honored, all right? So... We're, we're the same. Husbands and wives in many ways are the same. In many, in many ways, we're different. Now, let's specify each of those a little further. Number three, our sameness includes a few things we've already mentioned. Equal dignity, equal value, equal importance, all that's been covered. This next one hasn't. We're going to look at a verse in a moment. Equal sexual willingness and also equal obedience to any scripture not limited to the other spouse. What that means is 90-something percent of the Bible was just written to everybody. And that means when a husband or a wife reads the scripture, um, unless it's directed to the opposite spouse specifically, it's for both of us, right? It's for everyone. So 90 something percent of scripture is just for everybody. So our sameness includes, one more time, that we have equal dignity, value, importance, sexual willingness, 
and obedience. We have equal obedience to any scripture that's not limited to the other spouse. So if you're, uh, if you're a wife and you're reading the scripture, you can assume it applies to you unless it says, husbands, this one's for you. Or if you're a husband and you're reading the scripture, you can assume it applies to you unless you see wives, this is for you. That's the only time you're off the hook. Otherwise, it's everybody. Now, what about this part we haven't addressed yet in terms of equality? Sexual willingness. This is one of the most clear evidences to me that the New Testament is inspired by God. The scripture is inspired by God and meant to right the wrongs of a skeptical and confused culture. Now, um, for backdrop, the Greco-Roman first century world this was written into into gave a, a woman no sexual rights. It especially gave a wife no sexual rights. If you, um, if you were a single woman without any protection, or if you were a cult prostitute, you, had, you were used for sex um, and uh, eroticism. But if you were a married wife, you were only used for childbearing. But it was never both, you see. And who was free to do whatever they wanted? The man. That's, first, that's not biblical marriage. That's first century Greco-Roman marriage, okay? The man was called a Latin word pater familias, which means the head of the house. And he did whatever he wanted with whoever he wanted, whenever he wanted. And that was, that's what it meant to be a man. And guess what? The New Testament was written in a way, if you can read this next text the way they would have read it with those assumptions, you'll see how shocking it is. So let's read this. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 3 and 4. Put your Greco-Roman first century goggles on here and see what this sounds like. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal, that means sexual, rights. If you're listening like a first century Greco-Roman man, you're like, give to your wife her conjugal rights. We've never heard of those. Like we didn't know a wife had those. We didn't know that was an allowed thing or that was even a thing. And the scripture says you must give to your wife her sexual rights and likewise the wife to her husband. This is mutual. This is equal. One of those equal parts. For the wife uh, does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Nothing, uh, nothing frightening there if you're a first century Greco-Roman male. You're like, yeah, that's what we're assuming. But look at the next line. Likewise, meaning in the exact same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. This is wildly, wildly countercultural, and it shows that there's an expectation that within a Christian marriage, that there's not only fidelity and there's not sexual interactions going on outside the marriage, no matter what the rest of popular culture is doing, um, the idea for Christian marriage is that a husband and a wife would be equally attentive and available for one another according to their desires and needs. That is wildly countercultural. So we read Ephesians 5 and we're like, are women okay? Okay. But they, 2,000 years ago, would have read 1 Corinthians 7 and been like, are men okay to become Christians? Because they're going to lose a lot, right? Because it would have been seen that men were going to have to sacrifice areas of their life that they had never had to sacrifice before, right? So these are some ways that the Bible is radically, radically, radically invested in spousal sameness, right? But there is also some difference in role. And that's what Ephesians gets to now. So our fourth move today, number four, spouse difference includes, and I'm just grabbing the language right out of Ephesians. We'll define these words in just a second at long last. Spouse difference includes, direct from Ephesians 5, the submission of a wife and the love of a husband. Those are the key words in Ephesians 5. In the wives section is the word submit. In the husband section is the word love. I'm just pulling the English words right out. So this is, the, this is the focus of the behavioral difference between a husband and a wife. Now, what is, let's take the wives section first because that's the way the scripture does it. Verse 22 through 24 is wives and then husbands to follow. So we'll do wives first. What does submission exactly mean? Not the most popular word in the English language, not the most popular word in church. So what exactly does this mean? Let's start with what it does not mean. It does not mean tolerating abuse or abandonment. It does not mean tolerating abuse, ever, ever, ever. Um, I once got a phone call, so a new couple once joined a church that I was working for a while back in another state, and we could sense that there were just some marital issues that were going on, and sure enough, we got a call that the police were over at their house over a domestic violence call, and I got the, the call that we needed to come over from them. So uh, I showed up, and uh, thankfully nobody badly hurt or anything, but she was very intimidated and verbally battered, for sure. So she had to call the police. The police are there, he's there, she's there. And they said, you know, hey man, you've got to leave the house for the night, etc. And it was, we were about to leave. And the police said, who are you? <laughs> to me. And I said, I work at the church they're a part of. And the cops, next words I will never forget. The cops said, oh, 
So I guess you think we should just leave her in there and tell her to submit to him? And I said, no, and I deeply regret that that's ever been our reputation. No, that's not appropriate, that's not fitting. Um, this all assumes some amount of sanity in the person that we're talking about doing this to, okay? So um, no to abuse, period, 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 okay? Um, and it breaks my heart that all I had to say was church, and somebody was like, that means you want this wife to be battered, and you don't, you don't care about her leaving the home and only re-entering the home when a proper sense of trust has been rebuilt. And that's what I told the police officer. I said, there's, she needs to leave or he needs to leave until there's an appropriate amount of trust rebuilt where she could safely enter this space. Um, and so it's amazing how misused our text has become, right? Um, so it doesn't mean tolerating abuse or abandonment. It also doesn't mean obedience. Did you know this? Submission and obedience are not the same thing. More on that in a moment. Um, but obedience is not the same thing. In 1981, Princess Diana was the first member of the royal family to remove the word obey from her wedding vows. And since that time, uh, Kate Middleton and Meghan Markle have done the same thing. They removed the word obey from their wedding vows. At first, this was a big deal because in the 1662 Anglican Book of Common Prayer, the word obey was put into a wife's vows, that a wife would obey her husband. And guess what? We're not following the Anglican Book of Common Prayer of 1662. We're following Ephesians AD 62. And it doesn't say obey. It says submit. That's a different word. In fact, if Paul wanted to use the word obey, he would have used the word obey that he used in Ephesians 6 about children to their parents. And that's a different verb in Greek. So it's not talking about obedience either. Um, it's not talking about being docile. It's not talking about muting the personality. It's not talking about assuming the person lacks leadership ability. It's not about a wife pretending to be something she's not. It's not about withholding who God has made the wife to be. It's not about being in, a superior, in an inferior or a helpless state. It's not about making fewer or less important decisions. And it's not about following a, sin, a husband into sin or stupidity. So it's none of those things. And if you thought that submission was some conglomerate of all of that, um, then you're, you're probably thinking, well, what is the word? What can the word mean? Like, I thought that's, I thought, you, did you just remove the whole content of what submit means? Um, no. Here's what submission is. This is not the words of scripture. This is my imperfect summary of what submission means um, right here. Submission means offering or giving others an invitation to lead. That's what submission is at its heart. It's about saying, I offer you, I give you an invitation to lead. Doesn't mean I can't um, doesn't mean I'm clueless, doesn't mean I'm helpless, doesn't mean I'm docile, doesn't mean I'm muting my personality. It means I'm making a decision to invite you to lead with my eyes wide open and conditioned on some form of your sanity and wisdom, right? But I'm inviting you to lead. That's what submission is. Sometimes I find it helps here to introduce a non-marriage analogy just to try to like let it be seen, like what would that actually look like? So no analogy is perfect, so don't take it too far here, but I'll give you the best analogy I can from my life. I am in a submissive relationship with our elder team. So we're led by three elders. I'm one of them. There are two others. We have equal authority, right? There are three of us. And scripture makes, makes really clear that, um, that a church should be led by a group of men, never by one. So if you're, if you're at a church where there's like one, you know, uh, rogue pastor without an elder team around him, that's probably dangerous. So there should be more than one person leading a church. For us, there are three. I am in a submissive relationship with the other two. That does not mean that I have less to offer. I bring everything I can to the table to offer. It doesn't mean I have less drive. I am quite driven, they will tell you. It doesn't mean I have to mute my personality. I am full tilt, okay? It does not mean that I'm less heard, they hear me. It doesn't mean I'm less gifted. This is not even what we're thinking about. We all have strengths and weaknesses and a role to play. It doesn't mean I'm less important than they are because I'm in a submissive relationship to the elder team. It doesn't mean I have less volume or voice. They will tell you that I am quite loud and opinionated uh, on our elder team. They will tell you this. It doesn't even mean that I make less decisions. Think about this. They have other jobs. I work here. So in the course of a 40-hour work week, of course I make more decisions than they make. They're off making decisions at their job, right? So it doesn't even make that mean from a quantity perspective that I'm making fewer decisions. It also doesn't mean if they start doing crazy stuff and making bad decisions that I have to silently go along for the ride. If they go insane, I'm going to shoot up a flare. And if I go insane, they're going to shoot up a flare for help, all right, from the surrounding community. So it doesn't mean I'm passively along for the ride. It doesn't mean I can't lead. It doesn't mean I can't. It means that this is not the dance we're doing that displays God at this time. The dance we're doing is that I'm in a submissive relationship to the other two. And it doesn't mean that they can't follow. 
They follow in other relationships. I lead in other relationships. But at the end of the day, I am saying, I invite you guys to lead. I invite you guys to lead. Doesn't mean I can't. Doesn't mean any of the above. It means I invite you guys to lead because that's what God says is the dance I should do as a pastor to display God to the surrounding world, right? So this is the dance I do. That's the best analogy I've got. Not perfect, but the best analogy I've got for how submission works and doesn't. So one question I always get at this point before we move on to the husbands, I always get like, well, what if a wife is like the more talented leader? Like what if the wife is just a more talented leader? You all know the kind of situation I'm talking about. You may be in the situation I'm talking about. It is possible for a wife to be the more talented leader of the two. What happens then? And I want to make really clear, that's okay. And I know the couple that you're talking about. Like, I've done a lot of premarital counseling with many, many couples, over 25 now at this point, close to 30. And I want to tell you, I've been in a few where, like, she can lead circles around him. Like, she just can. Um, she commands attention. She has a stronger voice. Um, she has more clarity of thought. And no offense to him, because he's nice. But she is the stronger leader of the two. And it just happens that way. And she can't change it and shouldn't try. And he can't change it and shouldn't try. And that's just kind of the water flows downhill. And that's just kind of how it works. Everybody knows when she speaks, there's just something about it that just tends to command the attention of her peers. And she just has a leadership talent more than her husband. That does not prevent said woman from simply making a decision to invite her husband to lead at key moments in key ways. It doesn't mean that this is a decision she can't make, right? It doesn't mean that. A woman could be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company and come home and make this decision to invite her husband at key moments when it's, clear, it's clearly the time um, to invite her husband to lead. A woman can be the president of the United States and come home and make this decision. I bet that would be a challenge, but I think it could be done, all right? So uh, there is no... There is no cap or limit on how talented of a leader a woman can be in order to make this decision. Because once and for all, I'm trying to tell you today, this is not a referendum on ability. This is about a dance we do to display God. This is not a referendum on abilities or possibilities. This is a dance we volunteer into to display God. Some people will say, this is crazy. It's all theory. I don't believe it. Equals don't invite other equals to lead. Really, equals don't invite other equals to lead? Listen to this lyric from some poor Victorian age oppressed woman. Okay, this is poetry from way back when. Listen to these words. It's very seldom that you're blessed to find your equal. I still played my part and let you take the lead role. Believe me, I'll follow. This could be easy. I'll be the help whenever you need me. And that poor Victorian oppressed woman is, oh, whoops, who is that? That was Beyonce from Upgrade You in 2006, okay? I heard this in my house the other day. I was getting ready for this message, and I was like, run that back. <laughs> Did I just hear Beyonce perfectly articulate, perfectly? I mean, look at these words. I know it's art, and it's not meant to be dissected. I understand some of you are like, Get, Pastor, please just move on. Just let it stand. All right, but I, I can't help myself. Look at this. You're blessed to find your equal. Oh my gosh, this is biblical. I'm serious. I played, I played my part, so I didn't lose my part, okay? I let you take the lead role. I give you an invitation to lead. Doesn't mean I can't. It means I gave you an invitation. I'll follow. This could be easy. I'll be the help. She even says help whenever you need me. So listen, I'm going to move on. Some of, you, some of you are thinking like you're trying too hard. Listen, I don't think I am. Because I, I went to a lyric video on YouTube. I like, I, I like look this up and I go, to the, I go to the comment section. And you know what some woman did? She said, I love this section. And she grabbed these words, she stuck them in the comment section. And she said, quote, hold on. She said, only a crazy confident woman who knows her worth can say that. Wow. Okay, so for half the world, biblical teaching means you're oppressed and you don't know your worth. And this is evidence of it. Why would you remain in an arrangement like this if you knew your worth? But for people with sight to see, this is actually evidence of security and worth, okay, that you can be in this kind of arrangement, okay? And I just say that honestly because, like, when the pastor says it, you're like, no. But when Beyonce says it, some of y'all are like, yes. I don't know why it works that way. But this is exactly what we're talking about doing. I literally could not find I don't, now, I don't know what she's saying in the next verse. I don't know what she's saying in the previous verse. I don't know what she's doing now. So disclaimer. But this... This is good, all right? This is, this is Ephesians 5, all right? That's what we're getting at here. All right, now, what of the husbands? Let's move forward. What does love mean? If submission means, uh, if submission means the above, the aforementioned, what does love mean? Let's read the text, and then we'll go. Husbands, it's longer. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. So it's clearly the key idea. 
And it brings Christ into it. Remember, this is a dance that displays God. That's the goal. And gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Therefore, quotes back to Genesis, what we read before. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And then, making crystal, crystal clear that this isn't about abilities or, or civil rights or talents. It's about revealing God. This mystery is profound. I'm saying, I'm saying that these marriage roles refer to Christ and the church. We're trying to show the world something. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. All right, just a quick summary there at the end before he moves on and we'll finish Ephesians in a couple of weeks. So what is this love? Again, let's start with what it's not. It's not belittling a wife. She, nobody needs to be belittled, okay? Um, it's not treating a wife as if she's helpless. So um, husbands, think about this. If you married a Christian woman, which I'm assuming you did, if you're married and you're a Christian man, the Bible says marry a Christian woman. So I'm assuming you married a Christian woman. Before your wife was a married Christian woman, she was a single Christian woman who was responsible for her own walk with God and her own spirituality and her own journey. And that means she knows what that is and doesn't need you to tie her spiritual shoes. All right? So don't be belittling in the way you encourage a wife in her faith. Okay? She's done it before on her own. Right? So be an encouragement, but don't treat her like she's helpless. Um, similarly, love does not mean unnaturally doing too much. So you don't need to uh, unnaturally kind of like try to imitate somebody you're not, you know, like you hear this message and you're like, I'm supposed to love my wife. And then it becomes like mechanical and kind of too much. And your wife's going to look at you before the day's over and be like, at ease. All right. It is okay. Just be yourself. I want to be loved, but be yourself. All right. So it doesn't mean trying to do too much falsely. Um, and it also doesn't mean doing too little. This is the first and biggest move that is a, a huge move to make for many husbands. You've got to decide to do something. You can't do too little either. You have to reject passivity. So before you do anything, you have to decide to do something. So you have to reject passivity. What is passivity? We were at the beach about two months ago. And there, between us and the water, there is um, a man, an older man, sitting in his chair, an empty chair beside him, and then an umbrella. An umbrella starts to fall in slow motion. Slow enough that I'm thinking, he's going to catch that. I got time to run over there and catch that. All right, boom, all the way to the ground. What does he do? Julie, literally, cries for his wife. Julie's his wife. Her empty chair was right there. She's way off somewhere, and he literally cries, Julie. I'm like, dude, get up. Like, get up, catch the umbrella, do something. I like, look, I'm like, is he wearing a boot? Is like something wrong with his knee? Like, is there some reason he can't move? No, there's no reason. It's because he's probably had a 30-year habit of crying Julie, all right? Do something. So, like, just reject passivity. This is the first and biggest move, all right? Reject passivity. Christian husbands do not walk around the house. Julie, the rent went up. We need to make more money. Julie, the baby needs a diaper changed. Julie, the dishes are full again. Julie, we're out of groceries. Like, don't cry, Julie. Like, decide I, I'm going to do something, all right? So reject passivity, all right? You've got to decide to do something. So what does it mean, according to the verse, if it doesn't mean all those things? Love means, this is not scripture, this is my imperfect summary, love means adopting responsibility for cultivating the flourishing of the marriage. You could put wife, wife or marriage, either one probably right there. For cultivating the flourishing of the marriage through three things, care, provision, and protection. Care, provision, and protection. Now let's break this sentence down one at a time. What do I mean by voluntary responsibility? Um, what, does it mean, what do I mean by adopting responsibility? I mean rejecting passivity. I'm not going to cry, Julie. That's what that means. The next piece, to cultivate flourishing. What does it mean to cultivate flourishing? It means simply this. I've had somebody ask me this at the church before a couple years ago. What does it mean to cultivate flourishing in a home? If that's my primary responsibility and that's what I'm supposed to do, how do I do that as a husband? Here's my answer. Encourage what is healthy gently and discourage what is unhealthy gently. Again, Encourage what's healthy and discourage what's unhealthy in the home, in the marriage, in the, in the space that you're in. A couple tips on that. Um, give lots of grace and lots of space. Um, you don't want someone to breathe down your neck. Number two, um, lead yourself before you lead anyone else. It's hard for anyone to want to follow someone who doesn't lead themselves first, to even try to lead themselves first. So make a great effort to lead yourself first. Um, 
and, uh, and also try to address patterns in your home and not instances. Like, I don't know how, it would be so frustrating for me if like the first time I did something I don't, that just didn't seem quite right, if immediately Gabby like jumped out of the, you know, like next room and was like unhealthy, you know, I would find that so impossible to live up to, you know, but I would find it quite edifying if at some point, if I kept doing it over and over and over again and demonstrated a complete lack of self-awareness and continued down an unhealthy path, I would feel greatly encouraged if she said, I think there's a pattern here. I'm for you, not against you, but I think there's an unhealthy pattern here you keep getting in and you know, leaving that behind would be great. That is what I mean by addressing patterns, not instances. This is big for parents too, by the way. If you're a parent, address patterns with your kids, not instances. Keep you from breathing down their neck, all right? And then through these three things, care, provision, and protection. What does that mean? Care, it means you care. Words used in Ephesians 5 were words like nourishing, uh, cherishing, okay, so care. It's deeper than romance. It doesn't lack romance, but it's more than just romance. It doesn't, if, you, if you're like killing date night and flowers and whatever your version of romance is, but you're not just like caring at a deep and sincere level on a, on a significant basis, date night and vacation cannot make up for a lack of regular care. All right, so you just care. Number two, provision. What does provision mean? It means you earn a paycheck. That, just straight up. It means you earn a paycheck. It doesn't mean you have to earn more than her, and it doesn't mean you worship your paycheck, and it doesn't mean you find identity in your paycheck. That's a whole other mistake that husbands make is like they think if they make money, that's all they have to do. That's a mistake because then they fail to care, right? So it means you're earning something. Someone will always say in the spirit of gender interchangeability, they will always say, but what if, like what if, like wife is a complete boss and loves to work and dad is like a total toddler whisperer and hates to work and like she wants to work and he wants to be home with the kids. Is that okay? I would say if she feels nourished, cared for and like all the flourishing of the home is being cultivated by the husband, sure. But I'll tell you, that's rare. I've seen it once, maybe twice of all the couples I've interacted with. So we're talking about 99% chance, husbands, you just need to make some money, all right, of some kind. You, again, not, don't have to be more than her. It's not a contest. It, you don't need to find your identity in your paycheck. I'm telling you, you don't, this will keep you from crying Julie when the bills come in, all right? You want to earn something, all right? So that is important, all right? So that's what provision means. Um, and I understand how flexible this can be. When we started the church, we moved to New York um, three years ago. There were three church members. Gabby and I were two of them. It was wild, all right? And we started from scratch. And I was a church planter with a dollar and a dream. She was a nurse, which means paid, okay? So there was a, there was a season there where it was not our normal MO. And the way we spoke about this was, you know what? She said she was willing and not bothered at all to support our family during the startup phase. But there was no time when I thought, like, maybe the startup phase is 10 years long. You know what I'm saying? She can just kind of support our family. It's not going to work, okay? So if you're like, well, how flexible is it? I would say just give your wife permission to give you an honest answer, all right? Does she feel financial pressure that you should be feeling? Give her permission and roll out the red carpet for her to say so, all right? Don't, don't silence it, all right? Okay, so that's what I mean by provision, fair enough? And then lastly, protection. I know this sounds old school. I know, I know that word is like, I don't need a protector. You know, I walk around the city by myself all day, every day. Okay, I, I get that. I'm not trying to tell you that a husband is a bodyguard. Here's what I'm telling you. I'm telling you if something goes bump in the night and something enters the home and it's a bad person, the husband should die first, all right? That's what I'm telling you. The husband should give his life first. We were living uh, once on a business avenue on the ground floor, and our outer door opened right into our living room. Some of you guys came over to that house, so you know exactly what I'm talking about in that apartment. And, like, it was, if you could get through that living room door with one turn, you're in our home, okay? No outer person, no doorman, no. <laughs> no elevator in, okay? And so in the middle of one night, you know, bang, 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 like I hear like 2, 3 a.m. And I like woke up, I was like, what's going on? But what I didn't do was think, who got the last one? Is it Gabby's turn? You know, because we're doing this whole modern thing out here. You know what I'm saying? Like, Gabby, it's, Gabby's got to take a turn out here. No, that, I don't care. You can tell me that this is belittling all day long. I don't care what you say, okay? The, if something happens, you're not taking turns. And Someone always loves to find exceptions. Maybe you're that person. But someone's like, but what if the wife is an MMA fighter, Garrett? <laughs> okay, fine. Then they both go fight, okay? But the, the husband is in, all right? The husband is in. There is no, no. You hear what I'm saying, all right? 
So this is, to me, this is the only thing that makes sense. And like, we come into these spaces with such social sensitivity because we're really afraid of what our coworkers think and like what our roommates are gonna think and blah, 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 blah. And actually, I come to find out, this makes a lot of sense. All right, so number five, finally, my conclusion, which I can't force on you, not trying. This is my conclusion. The Bible is uniquely balanced. It will tell you where male and female are the same. Husbands and wives are the same. And it will tell you where they're different. And it's uniquely balanced and it leads to uniquely healthy marriages. If you want to see something work, like if you want to see a marriage work, just circle your part of the text, not even the other person's part. Some of y'all know like trying to elbow husband, wife, whatever, no elbows. Just look at your part of the text and just get busy doing it. Just like try as hard as you can to fulfill, if you're married, try as hard as you can to fulfill your part of the text. And I know if you feel like the other person's failing, your eyes are gonna to wanna to gravitate towards their part, just your part, and just give it a run. Just see what happens and see if it cultivates flourishing in your home and in yourself, okay? I have no idea if this feels safe to you, particularly from a female perspective, because the Bible's been twisted so many times to dead end women into the most impossible situations um, and it's not true scriptures that have that effect. It's twisting of scriptures that have that effect, right? And here's what I hope to say, and maybe the most audacious claim I could say today, and it's what I believe to my core. Maybe you don't believe it, and that's okay. I can't, I can't rush you along, but I will say this. I am convinced that the Bible, rightly practiced, rightly interpreted and practiced, has never led to the constriction or oppression of a woman, ever. One more time. I'm convinced. I don't know if you're convinced. This is where I'm at. I am convinced that the Bible, rightly interpreted and practiced, rightly, not wrongly, not twisted, not, not with some under the table advantage going towards the preacher or the husband or the whatever. I'm talking about the Bible truly and sincerely practiced has never led to the oppression or the constriction of a woman, ever. What it does lead to is the display of God. And this is where I wanna to close today. Marriage is designed to disclose and display God, all right? And God gave himself sacrificially in love so that someone would respond in trust, that we would respond in trust. And we're just hitting repeat on that when we live our marriages in this way. We're pushing repeat on that message that we want the whole world to hear, that there's a God who sacrificed for us, who had our highest concern in mind, and that's what a husband is supposed to do, is have the highest concern for his wife in mind to the degree that he's crazy self-sacrificial, that re-embodies the Christ piece of things in the role, and the wife is is called to respond with trust, to say, I voluntarily give you trust. And that's the church's response to Christ. And we're just putting that little drama on replay, that little act on replay over and over and over again until Jesus returns and makes things clear for himself. All right? So this is not about abilities. It's not about desires, passions. It's not even about distrusts and experiences. At the heart of this, it's about God wanting to reveal himself so people can find their way to him. That's what marriage is for and what it's about. All right? I am thankful that God, in seeing how he sacrificed himself for me, he won my trust. I was living in a way that violated every biblical truth meant to give women dignity. I was a total womanizer before I was about 20, 21, just completely given over to selfish desire. And I have seen what scripture said and be like, no, nah, I don't wanna do that because that doesn't sound very fun. I'd rather just go be the kind of guy everybody wants to avoid. And I just ran my life into the ground, racked up a bunch of shame and guilt and I saw the cross at some point in a new way and it won my heart and it won my trust. And I can tell you, I have never put the scripture into practice and lost since that time. I have never put a scripture into practice and lost. It's why we say the Bible is always the quickest path to human flourishing. We believe that on this topic when it really counts. Let's pray together and we'll take communion. Holy Father, thank you for this gift of, of teaching. I pray um, everywhere around the room and uh, just in, in every just deep dynamic between husbands and wives, Lord, that they would be trust built um, and that they would just see the kind eyes of a father in your guidance. And Lord, thank you for the grace that covers us when we fail this a thousand times. Lord, please give us the willingness to trust you and free us from our social shame, Father. We're so intimidated because as soon as some person who doesn't know you comes up to us and calls us a blast from the past, we melt in shame. And that is just not fitting for people who know you. So strengthen our spine, Father, and help us know we're making eye contact with you so we can make firm eye contact with the world. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Thanks for being with us. If these messages are strengthening you in your faith, we want to hear from you. Find us online at missioncity.nyc or email us at info at missioncity.nyc so we can celebrate everything God's doing in your life. We'll see you next week.